Okay, so in this tutorial, I'm gonna show you how to do the holy grail of time lapses. Now, what that means is that we go from either night to day or from day to night in the same seamless time lapse. So you might see the stars going across the sky and then you see the sunrise going through the sky and turning into daytime or the other way around. So tonight I'm gonna to be going from daytime into nighttime. Now the difficulty with that is obviously the exposures because you're going from bright sunlight during the day to obviously really dark at night and you really want to see the stars going across the sky. So to do that, we need certain bits of equipment. I've got some equipment here I'm gonna quickly run through, um, but really the most important thing is the software. So first things first, you have the camera. I'm gonna be using the Canon EOS 5D Mark IV because I know the quality's good. It's a um, high resolution camera. I've got a good wide angle lens, 2.8 lens, so I know I can capture the night sky with that but I also know that it's uh, compatible with everything that I'm doing here. Um, the camera's really, I've done it, I've used that camera so many times for time lapses. I know it works flawlessly, the battery power's good, but on the battery power, what I'm actually using tonight, because I'm gonna be photographing from about seven in the evening till about one in the morning. So that's uh, six hours. It's gonna be a six hour time lapse to make sure that I transition straight from, you know, still sunlight at 7 p.m. Uh, through to 1 a.m. So I know it's gonna be completely dark. Now, the criteria is that you need, obviously, a very clear day. So it's good if you've got a clear sky, because obviously you want to see the stars. But also, it's important that you, you do a time lapse when the moon is at its kind of uh, newest, if you like. And it just so happens to coincide, uh, coincide that tonight happens to be a clear night all the way through. And we've actually got uh, the, the base or almost at a new moon. So the moon's not going to actually brighten up the sky too much. It's not going to brighten up the land too much. Because if you try and do this when there's a full moon, it can really mess up your exposure. You'll end up with a really bright bulb kind of type thing going across the sky and it doesn't look great. So the equipment I'm going to use, so is the camera, the Canon EOS 5D Mark IV. I've got a plug-in power pack for that. So this is fully charged and I've run this for about eight to nine hours before and it's worked perfectly. So you just plug that in there, that goes in where the battery goes into the camera and that will just keep it going for as long as I want to do the time lapse. Like I say, it's good for about eight hours. So that's that. The next thing I'm actually using here, it's, it's a slider. Now this has got built-in time-lapse features into it. So I'm not gonna be using the camera's time-lapse. I'm gonna be using this. And this is called the Rhino Arc gear. So we've actually got a slider here with the Rhino. Now there's a couple of things this is good for. So if you're into videography, this is, this is a really good piece of kit. You've actually got a, let's see if I can get it going. So you've actually got a really nice smooth slider and this heavy weight on the end here actually allows the, the camera to really do a nice smooth and a smooth start, smooth finish. So if you wanna do some, some smooth video panning, that kind of thing, really, really good. But what you can also do is actually set this to go automatically. So if you're doing an interview with someone, you can have this very slowly going across all the time, all throughout maybe an hour interview, and it will go forwards and backwards throughout the whole interview. So as a B camera, it looks really good. You'd have the main camera like on me now, but then you may have a second camera with just that kind of going, it just adds a bit of a different dimension, adds a really kind of nice look to an interview. But it's also good for time lapses and moving time lapses. So if you imagine, I've actually got, this is a 24 inch uh, slider, and behind me in the bag there, I've got a 48 inch slider, so it's about a meter long. So you can get, you what you can actually do over a period of eight hours is have the camera move super, super slowly across, but you obviously have to have something in the foreground to make it look good, otherwise it's just not gonna show any movement. So you have something in the foreground and you over the eight hours, you'll just move it really slowly and it will turn as well. So you imagine that, if you've got a, a wall here with flowers and things, then you've got the sunlight and maybe a bay with water in it. So it's nice and sunny and as it goes across, as it gets to about here, the sun goes down, the stars come up and it's still moving and the camera's turning and it's turning with the stars. So it's hopefully gonna look really good tonight. So I'm actually taking it down to Newton's Cove in Weymouth. I know it's fairly dark down there. Like I said, it's a fairly new moon. It's all looking pretty good tonight. It's clear, so this is good. Now, obviously I can't do a time-lapse with this as it is, but I need to take this weight off. So part of the beauty of this kit is you can just take that weight off and it's pretty heavy. It allows it to do the nice smooth movement. See what it's like without it, it's awful. And then I put the motorized bit on here. So this literally just slots into where that was. So I have to make sure it's lined up okay. And then I'll just put that in there. So that slots on, locks into place. And then basically what I do is put some cables into here and then I've got the remote section here. So this bit will stay near the camera 
with a cable going into there and then I've got a cable going to this as well. So that twists, this is the motor that actually pulls it along. So I can't move it at the moment. It would need to be set up. But with this bit of kit here, I can do a few things. So first of all, I've got live motion. So if I had the camera on there and I was, I was doing some video work, I can actually go into live motion and then I can turn the wheel to slide. So I can literally turn the wheel and it will move left and right wherever I turn the wheel and it will change speed the more I turn it, okay? Or I can do what's called create a move and that would be the move I'd do for the interview. So I'd create a move, I'd say I just want it to keep going backwards and forwards for maybe half an hour or an hour. It'll just keep doing that while filming and if I wanted to turn, so say the interviewer or the person I'm interviewing or filming is there, I would have the camera so it literally stays on them throughout the whole arc, throughout the whole movement, the camera would stay on them, it wouldn't just go past them. Or you can have it going the other way. So it's a really good bit of kit in that respect. Then you've got time lapse, so you can do a simple time lapse, you push the button and it will calibrate everything and get it all ready to go. I'm gonna be doing an advanced time lapse tonight, which means I can actually set it up so that it will uh, go from one end of the slide all the way along and it will actually turn hopefully with the stars as they come up. So I've got to work out when the sun goes down and approximately about maybe an hour and a half to two hours after the sun goes down is when you'll see the stars more. So then it'll, it'll turn and obviously hopefully move with the stars. If we get to see the Milky Way, I don't know where it is at the moment, I haven't checked. If we get to see that, fantastic. But really all I want is uh, to show you how to do a day to night time lapse. So the kit is good. This Rhino Arc, all of this gear is fantastic. If you can get a slider with the Rhino Arc gear, this is the Arc bit because it obviously turns. Um, and then you've got the unit here which will control the time lapse and all the movements and everything. It's brilliant. And obviously you can get the, like I say, the, the 48 inch slider. It's brilliant. But then once you've actually done that, so I'm, I'm thinking I'm gonna be taking, uh, I've gotta work out the timings tonight. So the exposures in the daytime are gonna be something like uh, 200 to F11. Uh, ISO 100. So what happens, this is what you do when you're actually doing the time lapse. You've got to, all the time the, the, the light is constant, you can leave the camera, it'll just do its own thing. But then what happens, as the dusk starts to go, I'm constantly looking at the top of the camera to see where the exposure is. So using the monitor on the camera, I will let it go to maybe one stop or half a stop underexposed, then I'll turn the camera and overexpose by half a stop to a stop. Then let it slowly, as the light diminishes, I will let the camera go to shooting at one stop underexposed again, then I'll whip it up to one stop overexposed, and then just keep doing that until it gets completely dark. And at that point, I'll be doing something like 20 second exposures at about f2.8, maybe ISO 800, something like that, so it's still pretty clear with not too much grain. So I'll start off with daytime exposures and then slowly I'll have to, the point the sun starts going down to the point where it's pitch black, you have to be constantly changing the exposure. So it goes uh, underexposed, underexposed, overexposed, underexposed, underexposed, overexposed. So you have to keep doing that every sort of few minutes until it's completely dark and then you just leave the camera. So you'll see, you'll get to a point where you're doing maybe a 20 second exposure, like I said, F2.8, the camera's still moving, ISO 800, around that sort of thing, and then you can just leave it because it's back to constant exposure again. Then what will happen is after six hours, you'll end up with probably a few thousand photos, and obviously you're gonna get those uh, differences in light when it transitions, uh, and when you change the exposure, you're gonna get like uh, spikes in the exposure and differences, so it'll look really jittery and horrible, and that's where the software comes in, and I'm gonna to come to that once I've done the time lapse. So once I've finished tonight, Tomorrow, I'm gonna to actually get everything prepared and then I'm gonna show you how the software works because I've never seen anything like it. It does everything for you, it's absolutely fantastic. You'll end up with buttery smooth exposures all the way through from daytime to nighttime and vice versa. The software is an absolute must if you wanna do this sort of exposure. Otherwise, you've gotta do it all manually and it will take you days and days because it's really hard to do. But the reason I'm showing you this is because if you want to maybe sell time lapses or sell your video clips and things like that, sliders are great for video because it just adds that different dimension to video clips that you can sell on stock video sites. But if you want to sell stock video time lapses, then not only having a moving time lapse would be good, but doing from day to night makes it so unique and so different that people are more likely to buy that. But it also wows your clients. So if you wanna do a commercial video for people, then it's gonna be fantastic for that. But in the instance, for the sake of this, we're actually gonna think about selling the time lapses. It's a lot of work. So you think what it would take someone to actually go out and do this. 
First of all, you've got to get the kit, then you've got to prepare everything, charge all the batteries, then you've actually got to do the time lapse over between six and eight hours and throughout the night. And then you've got to do maybe a half a day to a day's worth of processing. So for someone to actually do that, it's a pain in the butt. So they would rather buy the time lapse that you've done. So there's no harm in getting this kit together, getting the software, creating a whole bunch of these time lapses from different subjects, different topics, especially on tourism and travel. You can get some amazing shots of, of places. Now you don't need to use the slider for this. You can actually just use the arc on a, on a, um, on a tripod or you can basically just do it without the movement and just have it on a tripod and then do your zooming and stuff in post-production. So if you are going on holiday, it's worth thinking about this sort of day to night time lapse and then do all the kind of software stuff when you get home. Because trust me, people are more likely to buy something that catches the eye that's totally different to anything else they've seen before. So that's pretty much it. What I'm gonna to do tonight is get down to the bay for about half past six, set everything up, get the camera running, and I'm gonna be shooting till about one in the morning. If I can manage till about two and the battery's still okay, I'll go to about two o'clock in the morning. And hopefully we'll get a really kind of good series of shots. But then the next time you see me, I'm gonna be on the computer showing you exactly how to obviously offload everything and how, how to prepare the photos um, because you've got to do some work in Lightroom. This is called LR, Lightroom uh, time lapse. So we have to actually go into the software, but it's only minimal editing. If you think you've got maybe two, 3,000 photos or one and a half to 2,000 photos, you haven't got to edit every single one. You've only got to edit about 20, maybe 25 or even less of the photos and then the software does everything for you. So it's minimal work on that, but it takes a long time to render everything out, but we'll come to that. So I'm gonna head off tonight, get all this done, and then next time you see me, we'll be, or I may do a, a couple of clips while I'm actually down there by the by the water's edge, um, just to sort of explain what I'm doing, but then obviously we'll come back and do it in the software. So great, we'll see you in a bit. Oh, one other thing, I forgot, the tripod. Now, the tripod you need for this, obviously for the camera, at the moment is on just a standard photography tripod. So it's stable, it's not doing anything. Uh, there's no movement or anything, so it's perfect for that. So if you're doing a standard time-lapse, a normal kind of three um, pronged without any attachments in between the legs, normal standard photography tripod's absolutely fine. But if you're doing something with movement, then you're gonna want something a bit bulkier. Now this is a, a video tripod, and the good thing about it is it's got uh, brackets in between the legs, so it holds them in place but you've also got on the bottom, you probably can't see them, but I can either have the pads on the ground or there's spikes. So it will actually hold the tripod really well in place and I can weigh it down so it's not gonna move. So if you think about when you're actually doing a moving uh, time-lapse, especially if you've got the, the one meter um, slider, then obviously as the camera moves, the weight's gonna kind of change and it may push down a bit. So you may get, in the time-lapse, you may get some movement. So you want a really sturdy, solid tripod um, and it's even worth with the one meter one having two more tripods underneath each end. But for something this size, I can have it on that tripod, no problem, with the camera on top and it will just slide either way and it shouldn't be too much weight differential to actually uh, have any movement in the, the final time lapse. So always make sure you've got an appropriate tripod for whatever you're doing. If you're using a slider, go for a huge kind of video tripod. If you're just using the camera, a normal tripod will do. But the last point is, the last caveat, is don't have the tripod on grass because over time it could sink even just half an inch or a quarter of an inch is enough to make the uh, the time lapse kind of go out of sync and you, you'll get some movement. And, and if you're walking around the camera, actually looking at the settings, then your footprints, even, even you walking around, may cause it to move slightly as you sort of compress the earth a little bit. So just make sure you're on solid ground with a good tripod and then you're good to go. So we'll see you in a bit. Okay, so this is the scene I've chosen for the time lapse. Uh, we're down at Newton's Cove in Weymouth. It's looking pretty good. Uh, let's just show you what we've got here. Coffee, essential. We've got the camera set up there. So we've got the camera on the Rhino Arc, firing about every 17 seconds. And then we've got it down here, the controller, battery pack, and then the motor to send it all running. Uh, and the, what's gonna happen is, the camera's pointing over there at the moment and by the end of the time lapse, it's gonna be over here and it's gonna point over to the right. So I'm hoping that we're gonna get star trails coming up and over that way. And also the ships in the distance, we're gonna get some movement. Um, but really to start with, the shutter speed's quite fast, 250th at F8, so the sea's gonna look quite jittery at the start of the time lapse, but I might smooth it out in the software and I'll show you how cool that is when we get to that point. Um, but yeah, it's about, I'm doing a six hour time lapse. 
the end result is going to be a 50 second time lapse that's with one shot every 17 seconds and obviously when the sun goes down starts going down have to start adjusting the shot speed and the apertures and everything uh, but hopefully it'll come out all right so yeah we've got until it's half past six now so i've got until half past midnight to stay here uh, it's a nice evening though so it's all pretty cool so yeah we'll uh i may see you a bit later when it's super dark if not i'll see you in the software in the morning okay so the time lapse was done last night now before i go any further i will explain that i made a couple of kind of schoolboy errors on the time lapse uh, first of all this is the system. I'm going to show you how this works in a second. This is what was actually set up, but you just have to imagine it on the tripod legs. But this is the basic setup I used last night. Um, I did have a slightly different lens on because I'm using that on the camera now. Um, but one thing I did have, the, I had the tripod head on top of the Rhino Arc, which is the thing that actually makes the, the, uh, the time lapse move, um, but I didn't actually lock it in place. So Occasionally when I was changing the shutter speed on the camera, when, when you start going into nighttime from daytime, the light changes quite quickly, so you have to keep changing the shutter speed. Now the error I made, I think I moved the camera a couple of times, so there may be a couple of jitters throughout the night as the, the time changes and as the, as the light diminishes. So you may see that I actually made a couple of small movements on the camera, which is really annoying. Um, secondly, as it got darker, um, a lot of people that were that were around, there were some kids at the end of the road and they were smoking, um, not normal cigarettes, um, and they were having a drink and a laugh and everything. Uh, they weren't particularly worrying, they were nice kids, but they were just out doing what kids do. Um, they had a couple of cars there and everything, so I had to watch the headlights hitting the camera at some point, so I shielded it as they went past. Um, but really, when it got to about uh, 11 o'clock, then I, everyone had gone and it was pitch black where I was, and behind me on the hill, I could hear some rustling um, and I was thinking, oh God, <laughs> you, you, you kind of get a bit jittery when it's late at night. You're out by yourself with expensive equipment in the middle of nowhere, no one can see you. Um, and then I heard a very big rustle and it sounded like a human behind. So I started panicking, but I think it might have been a fox or something or a cat or a dog or whatever, but it sounded quite big. So I kind of looked to see how much longer I had to go on the time lapse and it was about 77% done, but I accidentally hit the stop button. So the time lapse stopped. Um, so rather than getting six hours from half past six in the evening till half past midnight, I actually went from half past six in the evening to about half past 11. That equates to about a 50 second time lapse, I think. So hopefully I'll get something out of this. Now, I actually ended up with about 993 photos. So we're gonna go now into the, into the actual software. Now it's called LR Time Lapse, and I've got the pro version and it's uh, been completely updated. So the good thing about this guy, he really knows his stuff. Um, it's brilliant for time lapses and he's always updating it for free. So he's always adding new features and add, add new functionality to it, improving the way it works and everything like that. So really good bit of software. There's a link below um, if you wanted to get this software. So if you want to do time lapses where they're seamless from day to night or night to day, this will do it for you perfectly and you'll see that in a second. But also, if you do time lapses throughout the day without doing this uh, transition from night to day, the, the, the holy grail, you will still get fluctuations in your exposures. So if a cloud goes over or anything like that where it just changes. So the time lapse doesn't look super smooth. You'll always get these flickering kind of slightly different exposures. With this, it flattens the curve completely. So you'll actually end up with a smooth, completely seamless, really good looking time lapse. So what you do, I'm not gonna go massively into detail, but what you do here is you go into LR time lapse and you find where the actual folder is and you click on that. So you're seeing this on screen now. And what it will do now is load all of the images. You can see them all starting to load uh, up the top here, loading directory, and you can see them loading here. That's 450 already, so we'll just let those finish. But you can see the location I was, it's called Newton's Cove in Weymouth, and we've got one cruise ship in the moment in the background at the moment, but eventually I kind of moved round, the arc moved round to see all of the cruise ships as the night fell and as the lights on the ships came on. So there we go, they're all loaded. It's now loading the EXIF data. This software is phenomenal. It gives you all the information, the width, the height of the image, the date and time of the original, the exposure, the timings, the aperture, shut speed, ISO, everything. So you can see now it's starting to load all of the EXIF data and we're gonna see the previews come down the side. So you can see what's happening here. It's starting to load all of the, the preview for the luminance and you can see all the numbers going down the side there, but also you can see it going along this curve here. This is one of the exposure curves. And you can see 
that it actually starts to dip right towards the end as the, as the night falls. So these exposures will change rapidly. So I'm gonna let that load and then we'll come back to it once they're all done. Okay, so that's now all done. All of the exposures have been brought into LR time lapse, and you can see on the screen here, this blue line is all the exposure fluctuations. So you can see there at the beginning, I didn't need to change the exposure at all because it was pretty constant light. Then you can see here, I changed the exposure about one or two stops. So what I tend to do is let it go either half a stop or one stop underexposed, then knock it up to half a stop or one stop overexposed, and then let it go down to underexposed, then, then open the shutter speed or change the parameters so that I've got more light coming in. And I just keep doing that all throughout the night. And then you can see at the end, we've got another constant because it was fixed, because it had got dark, it was a fixed uh, speed. So I didn't need to change anything again. So at the beginning of your time lapse, you won't need to do any changes. At the end, when it's pitch black, you won't need to do any either. It's just as the light falls or increases if you're doing it the other way around, that's when you have to make all the, the changes. So let's have a quick look at the time lapse at the moment as it stands. Okay, so if you watch the screen, you can see there, there's a lot of people about there with some people on paddle boards. You can see it slowly tilting. That's the first exposure change you saw. And you can see it moving around slowly. It's starting to get dark now. So there's another exposure change and another one, another one, another one, another one, another one. So you can see it's getting dark quicker. So I'm having to make more changes, but as a time lapse, it looks awful. But you can see the lights coming on the ships. There were some divers underwater with lights. Um, you can see the stars coming up now looking pretty cool and then we get to the end, okay? So not a bad time lapse, but obviously it's not gonna be good because you've got all those changing, all the fluctuating uh, changes. So if we go through, you can see here, that first change here went from, if you look on the screen, I was between 17 and 18 second intervals. The aperture at this point was F8, shutter speed of 320, ISO 100. But that first change, I actually moved it to 200th uh, of a second. So we went down one stop of the exposure there and then it keep, kept going down. And as we went through, you can see that I changed the shutter speed down first. So I kept bringing the shutter speed down to it till it got to a point where I felt, felt I needed to change something else. So then we started bringing the aperture down. I ended up at F4 and then finally F3.2. Uh, the shutter speed at this point is a fifth of a second. ISO still at 100. As it got darker, I went to one second, two and a half seconds, still at F4, then to 3.2. Then I started ramping up the aperture, uh, sorry, the ISO to 320. And eventually I finished on throughout the night, the exposure was 3.2 aperture, F3.2, 10 second exposure at ISO 500. That was then fine throughout the whole night. So we've got basically the whole time lapse on there. We've got it all loaded into uh, LR time lapse with all the data and everything. So now what we do is hit this. This is very simple. This is how it works. You're on visual workflow and you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten things to actually do. And you just follow them in order. This is how good this software is. So first of all, we hit the keyframes wizard. And what that will do is show you, it'll put a certain amount of keyframes based on its own intelligence on where it thinks all the major fluctuations are. And the reason for that is you need to work on those, those uh, keyframes in Lightroom. So it's given me, I think about 18 keyframes. So you think out of 990 odd photos, I've only got to work on about 18 photos in Lightroom. I don't have to work on any others. The software will do the rest. So it's absolutely brilliant. So we've done that. Now this button will only show if you've got a holy grail, if you've gone from day to night or night to day. So what this will do, it says it equalizes the steps in brightness that were introduced when shooting with the holy grail method from night to day, day to night. So then we click on there. And you can see there we've got massive fluctuations. So the fantastic thing about this is this whole thing here needs to be flattened out. That whole orange curve needs to be flattened. So you literally take this rotate button here and you move it until it's about as good as you can get along that line. So it's got to be about there and we're going to stretch it as well. So we stretch it so it's flat. Then we rotate it around so it goes along that line. <laughs> How cool is that? Let's see if we can stretch it a bit more. I think that's about right, actually. So how cool is that? That's how easy you actually do the transition from night to day. So we've now got a pretty flat curve showing all of those transitions. So then we just hit save. It will save all that metadata. Then what you have to do is move all of these into Lightroom. So it's very, very simple. All you do is click this drag to Lightroom. It says, 
drag this but every site every step by the way if you hover over it it tells you every stage what you need to do or what's happening so this one says drag to Lightroom drag this button into the Lightroom library to add the sequence to the catalog make sure the add option is selected in Lightroom's catalog uh, if the sequence is already there it gives you all the information there so what I'm going to do is click it drag it take it into Lightroom and just drop that will then load all of those photos into Lightroom so we'll come back in a second when that's done Okay, so there we are, they're all loading now, they're all in there. So the next stage, if we go back to LR time-lapse, it will tell you what you need to do. Uh, set the filter LR T5 full to full sequence, go to grid view, select all, read metadata from files. So let's go through those. We go to LR full sequence, so if we go to Lightroom, uh, we've got to import them, sorry. So if we import all of those photos, so that's done, they're all imported into Lightroom now. So if we go down to the filter here, we go to LR T5 full sequence and we go to metadata and save metadata to file, continue. Okay, so that's gonna save all that metadata. Let's see what's next. So then we select all read metadata from files. We've done that. So now you have to edit the keyframes. So you've already got them loaded. So then we actually change the filter for the uh, sync for the keyframes. So if we go back to Lightroom, we change this filter now to just the keyframes. And you can see there, we've just got those photos. And it's actually 19 images. So what we need to do now is just edit each one of these to make them relatively close to each other. So I'll do this fairly quickly. I'm not gonna do this perfectly like I normally would. So we'll take the first one here, the first image. We're going to de develop. And I want to kind of flatten this out. So I want to make it a bit more HDR. So the light, the, the ship there is a bit light. Uh, so if we bring the highlights down a bit and we bring the shadows up to bring detail out in these bushes over here. Um, and then if we bring the exposure down a touch, let's bring the highlight right down. And then we'll change the texture, do a bit of dehaze, a bit of vibrance, touch of saturation. So it's not looking too bad at the moment. We can still see detail in there. I'm going to add a bit of sharpness as well. So I'm going to take, this is just the way I do it, bring the radius, uh, the radius down to 0.7, just bring the sharpness up a bit. That looks okay. Touch of noise reduction, just because it's going to, I want it to go through the whole thing because we do go to ISO 500 a bit later. Then I'm going to do the remove chromatic aberration and change the profile uh, match to the lens. So it's a bit of correction. And that's pretty much it. I'm only, only going to do this very basically. So what you actually do at this point, while the photos are still fairly similar, so if we look at the next one, it's still fairly similar. So what I'm gonna do is hover over or select the one I've actually done already, and then push control on my keyboard and select the next one as well. Then go up to scripts and sync keyframes. That will automatically do the second one as well. So you can see here, that's the second photo now. So that's pretty much matched the other one. So I'm gonna do the same again for the next one. So I select this, that one and then go to the next, select scripts, sync keyframes. So if we have a look at that, they're all pretty much starting to look fairly similar. It's only when they get really dark that I'll start to make ad additional adjustments. So let's go to the next one. That's still pretty bright. So let's do the same again. We'll select the previous, hold control, select the new one, go to scripts, sync keyframes. Let's have a look at that one. It might start getting a bit darker now. So it's starting to get a bit dark, but I'm, I'm looking at the, the cruise ships to see how they, they go in the whole overall scene. So the next one is still a bit bright. So let's do that. Do the same again. Select the previous and the new one. Sync them together. And it's going to start getting darker. I might just leave it as it is. I'd normally keep it bright. So I'm going to just keep going with this at the moment. So let's select the one we've just done. Press Control, select the new one, go to scripts, sync keyframes again. And you can see it's starting to get dark now. I'm trying to work out what I'm gonna do here. Let's look at the next one. Not such a big difference now. So let's do the same for one more. Script, sync keyframes. Definitely getting darker. So I might brighten up the next one a little bit. So let's do the same again scripts, sync keyframes, but let's make it a touch brighter. And you can obviously change all the temperature. You can do whatever you want, whatever you fancy in, in Lightroom, you can actually change. I've just made that slightly brighter. So let's look at the next one. You can see the bit of warmth coming in now as the sun sets. 
script sync keyframes so that's the new one it's looking a little bit dark let's just expose it a bit more just a tiny bit get a bit of brightness there then we've got the next one you can see now the sun's gone down in the next one so let's sync them and have a look at it yeah you can see it's getting a bit quite a bit darker now so i might just leave it as it is i'm not going to brighten it anymore i want it to go in a kind of nice smooth darkness uh, the next one's gone a bit blue so you can see there we've actually got quite a nice sky the next one it goes very blue so i'm going to change the the color on that one so first of all i'm going to sync them both just to get the same exposure and then i'm going to just change the temperature of this up a bit so we're going to bring that temp up just so it looks a bit more kind of nice if you like so let's compare the two we lose the red but the temperature stays a bit better so let's just bring it up a touch more that's okay so we look at the next one it's very blue as we're getting darker so let's select the previous press control select the new one scripts sync keyframes and that's gone a little bit blue uh, better let's increase the temperature again just want to keep it warm looking throughout as much as possible anyway then it goes very dark see the lights have come on the ship now so let's select the previous control select the new one sync the keyframes that's not looking too bad now ships aren't looking too bad obviously there was movement because of a longer exposure As you can see the divers in the sea there uh, they had lights underwater so that, that'll look interesting um, ship lights are coming on doesn't look too bad let's have a look at the next one there they are look at these two that should hopefully look quite good when it when it kind of comes out so let's sync those two and see how that's acted that's good okay i like the temperature now it's not looking too bad this is where we've got longer exposures i may have made some errors you can see the ships aren't looking too bad but they're obviously very bright so i can't really bring the highlights down much more let's bring the whites down a little bit just to try and decrease those but with a 10 second exposure of cruise ships fully lit up you're not going to get much uh joy with the lights there they're going to be overexposed so let's now sync those two only a couple more to go so that's looking okay so that's maybe gone a little bit too bright so let's bring the temperature down a touch just to make sure they match a little bit better okay that's from that to that that's okay maybe looks a bit purple bring I'm going to leave it as it is just for the purposes of this so the next one is getting very dark you can see the stars coming through um, what I'm going to do now is actually start to change the to get the stars to show up more so let's sync where do they stars are there so let's go back to that one and let's uh, change the clarity so I'm going to bring the clarity up to bring the stars out but it looks like I've just changed the exposure a little bit that's actually not too bad let's uh, sync those two again look at the next one I want to see the stars really sort of coming out there we go let's put the clarity up a bit more just to really get them to pop and do a bit of dehaze as well so you can see the stars kind of popping out now looks like we've got a bit of a shooting star there as well uh, let's sync that to the next one let's see what that does okay let's bring the temperature down a bit and you can see there we're starting to get some more clarity let's put the clarity right up not looking too bad now there's loads you can do here you can obviously set a graduated filter at the top and work on the sky some more so if i just uh, do that here and i want to change the exposure of the sky down a bit or just keep it normal but then change the clarity again so you're actually bringing out the clarity in the stars so let's leave it at that for now again i'm not going to i would normally spend hours doing this but i'm doing it fairly quickly at the moment let's sync those two See what that looks like on the next one a little bit too warm let's come off there so let's bring the warmth down again I don't want it to looking too warm let's compare it to the previous it's okay clarity is looking good with the stars now it's starting to really sort of show them up so let's do that again let's do one of these bring the temperature back to normal but increase the clarity just to get the stars coming out and then we'll sync that to the next one again i'm not an expert with this but i'm just doing it fairly quickly just to give you an idea of how this software works uh, the next one looks okay it's getting really dark now let's 
bring the temperature down a little bit again. I'm not working on anything else at the moment. This is just going to be fairly rushed just to show you how it works. Um, and then we'll look at the last one. Let's just sync those two. Sync the keyframes, have a look at the last one. Not too bad, the sky looks okay. Let's bring the temperature down very slightly. Again, I'm not working massively on it. Let's just see, that'll be okay. That'll show the stars that'll work pretty well. So let's select all of those. Now you go back to Lightroom. Once you've finished uh, editing all the photos, you go back to LR Lightroom and see what it says. Uh, it says basically blah, 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 save metadata for all keyframes from grid view when finished. So what you need to do now is save all of that metadata in here. Just open that back up again. Uh, you need to save all the metadata. So you go back here and you go into grid view, into the library, into grid view, select all of those, and then go to metadata and save metadata to files. Okay, so it's now gonna save all that metadata that should be done. So let's make sure we've finished everything there. That's good. So we go to the next bit. It says here you will be returning from Lightroom or Bridge to continue the workflow in LR time lapse. So now what we need to do is reload all the photos with those keyframes. So we just click reload and this may take a little time. So it's reading all the XMP metadata and that's now done. So what we do next to go to auto transition, this will create a keyframe based transition uh, so we'll click on that you can see now it's calculating all the transitions that it needs to do for the actual time lapse. Okay, so there you go. You've got loads of different values here. Um, all of these you don't need to really know too much about for now, but you can go into the depths of, of what it's all about. It's very, very cool. Um, so we just want to keep this one. So now we've done the auto transition, we click visual previews. This is a bit that may take some time. So it's saving everything now. Now what it will do is create brand new exposures for all of that based on your workings. It will basically flatten out the curve, but this actually takes quite a bit of time to do. So let's just see it's starting. Okay, so the visual previews have happened and you can see this pink line here, it's kind of flattened out the curve quite a bit. And if we look in the actual files, you can see that where the first change happens here, it's actually flattened out. It's a, it's a more steady gray gradual uh, color. So you can see that throughout all the gradations have done, but you've still got some flickering there. So if I play this time lapse now, you can see it all the way through. You will get some flickering still. Now, bear in mind that I didn't do as much work as I'd normally do for this review. I'd normally spend maybe a couple of hours doing all the transitions perfectly, doing the editing so it's perfect. And you can see on the screen now, you're starting to get some flickering as it goes from day to night, but it's still working pretty well. So you can see the transition, see the, cruise ship lights coming on now very gently, very gradually. Then you'll start to see the star stars appear and they move across the sky, still a little bit of flickering, and then it goes fully into nighttime. Okay, so it hasn't gone too badly, but the next bit we actually go to along here is visual de-flicker. So if I click that, you can see here that we've got this curve that we can flatten. We can do it as uh, little or as much as we want. So if I start at zero, that's what it's like at the moment. And as I drag it along, I want to flatten that curve even more so there's no flickering. So if I took it to about there, you can see on this screen that it's very flat. It's going to actually flatten out all of those exposures, all of those curves. In fact, let's go a little tiny bit more just to flatten it right out to about there. So that's going to smooth all those transitions. So if I now click apply, uh, you've got accuracy, multipass. I'm not going to do any of this at the moment. Obviously, you can go into greater detail with this to do multipass to make it really, really perfect. But what I'm going to do at the moment is just click apply and you'll see what happens here now is this curve will change. It's just saving everything. And you can see now it's going to keep the ones it doesn't really need to change, but it's going to move along and it's going to change all of these transitions again. So it's just going to go through them all. Let's go back to the start. You can see where it's actually changing them all. So here we go. So you can see it's gradually changing all the ones it needs to. Obviously some won't need to be changed at all because we haven't had any flickering going on but you can see all of those ones are changing. So if we go to the first point where it actually is quite a big change, which is here, we should see these values pretty much straighten out. So that'll take a while to get there. In fact, it's starting now. If I click on that, it may speed the process up. So that's gonna bring that exposure right down correct to there. 
So the values are much better now. There's much less flickering going on. So again, we're gonna wait until that all completely done uh, is finished. So all the transitions have smoothed. You can see along there, the green lines wiping out the, the previous ones and it's gonna uh, fill those with the correct transitions and the correct exposures. So it's literally changing all of the photos to actually make sure the exposures match. So every single one is gonna match the, the following or the previous one, so we'll get a nice smooth transition. So once that's done, we'll come back and we'll watch that transition, we'll watch that uh, time-lapse again and show you the difference it's made to those flickerings. Okay, so now we've got a, a relatively flat curve. You can see that going all the way through now. And if I take you to this one point here, I wanna point something out to you. There's a little bit of a spike, see this here? little bit of a spike and if I go to that that's an exposure fluctuation I'll show you what it is there you go you can see this side lit up and that was actually a car coming down the street and obviously my lens was it was just enough to create a bit of flare coming into the camera so that one kind of frame is where a car in between so you're talking 34 seconds because they're 17 second exposures so in that time between exposures a car during the exposure kind of flicked round into the lens so that's a fluctuation there but if we watch the time lapse through again now, you can see that most of the flickering should have gone. Now we could have refined it a lot more, like I said, but this is again, just doing this relatively quickly for the purposes of the, of the tutorial. But you can see now we've got a really kind of smooth transition. The light's starting to diminish now. You can see the clouds moving. You'll see the cruise ship lights just about start to come on now. Hardly any flickering at all. It's really good. The waves are getting smoother. You saw the divers there. There was a plane went across or something. Stars are coming up now. And it's a very, very smooth transition. So I'm pretty happy with that. I would normally, like I say, spend a bit more time doing it, but that now is a pretty much a perfect transition from day to night with the stars coming across. There are ways to actually make the stars stand out even more, but I haven't got time to go into it here with, you just basically work on the raw metadata on the um, keyframes and you get that, those stars to pump out a lot more. So you'd actually create a, a kind of a gradation bit where you would work just purely on the sky and really increase those stars and everything to make them really pop. But this is to show you how you transition from day to night. So obviously you would spend a little bit more time on this. So what, all we have to do next is actually render out the video. So effectively what you've done here is you've taken 19 of the most prominent changes throughout that whole 992 photos and you've worked on those. Then what the software does, LR time lapse, will go and kind of flatten that to as much as it can. It will take those that data and it will work out a transition throughout all of the photos. So it's effectively working in, photo, in Lightroom for you. So it's transitioning them all. Then when you actually do the visual de-flicker, it's actually going through all the photos again and changing the raw data on every single photo so that it matches, so it creates a smooth transition. So really, LR time-lapse is actually working in Lightroom for you. It's doing all the, all the gradations, all the changes to all the exposure and all the values you've changed throughout. So it's a really, really good program. So what you do next is go to render video and it says, uh, you read the metadata in Lightroom. So now that all the metadata has been produced in, light, in LR time-lapse, you need to pull that into Lightroom. So you, haven't, you shouldn't have closed Lightroom at this point, um, but the data will still be there if you have. Uh, and then, so if we go into Lightroom now, and we're gonna select all of these, we'll go back to LRT full sequence, select everything, and we're just going to now go to metadata and read metadata this time from files, and we're gonna do that. So you'll see each, there you go, they're all starting to change now. So that metadata is being read on every single photo, and it's creating all of the changes you made in LR time-lapse, and it's showing you a visual rep representation inside Lightroom, and you can see up here, it's reading them fairly quickly. So I'm going to stop recording, and then we'll come back when that's done. Okay, so that's now done. All of the photos have had the metadata applied to them. So 992 photos have now been adjusted in Lightroom based on what's happened in LR time lapse. So that's, that's now ready to be actually exported as a time lapse. So to do that, you go to File, Export, and then once you're in Export, Ah, right, we can't do this from the actual folder. We have to go to where we've saved them all. So let me just change this. We have to actually go to the time lapse down here. The time lapse, there we go. So now you go to, you have to go to the actual folder where the, the photos are stored. So we go to export again. And what you've got here, it's already filled in the bits with LR time lapse. It'll give you all the details. 
and we're going to call this not the cruise to day to night let's change this okay so i'm going to put that in the folder where all the photos are and you've got a lot of choices here now i always bring this down to export time lapse uh, with lr time lapse and you've got lots of choices you can have it as 4k 8k the original size you can do it as jpegs or tiffs there's massive amounts of data that's going to go. If you did 16-bit TIFFs, you're going to end up with massive files, and I'm talking 120 megabytes each, where it's then going to stitch them all together. You'll end up with a huge file of many, many gigabytes that's going to take, be really hard to render. So in the first instance, I would say I'd recommend going at 4K UHD 8 bit JPEGs. That's going to create good enough files to create a really nice looking time lapse. But the more experience you get with this, you can then start experimenting with 6K and TIFF files and more bits, 16 bits and all that kind of thing. So this is pretty good. So all I'm going to do there is select done, uh, sorry, export. Let's just make sure I get everything set up right. That's going to go there. So I'm going to click export. And what's going to happen now, it's going to prepare all the files. And if I show you the actual folder, what's going to happen? It's just preparing to export. It's going to start now rendering. It's not rendering the time lapse at the moment. All it's going to do is actually export every single one of those 992 photos. I told you this is quite a lengthy process. So it's going to export every single one of those 92, uh, 992 photos as an 8-bit JPEG. Then it'll come up with something that says, now you want to render that as a video and it'll do everything for you. It just takes time. So in between each bit like this, you need to just have a bit of a break. So I'm going to pause the cameras at the moment. Let's just go into the folder and see if it's doing it properly like it should be. OK, I'm going to drag that over and I can show you all the photos appearing in there. So you can see every photo is appearing now. It's got to do that 992 times. So I'm going to pause everything and then I'm going to come back and we're going to then render out the final video clip. OK, so once all the photos have been processed, I'll show you here. We've got all 993 photos here all done and you can see kind of the time lapse working there, but they're all now processed. They're all done. And once it's actually produced them all, this screen appears, the render video screen in Lightroom and it's created by the LR time-lapse. So you can see here you've got multiple options what you can do with the actual time-lapse itself. So let's start up here. The codec, we're gonna give it ProRes. I like ProRes, but obviously most people use MP4 for most of their video work, but I'm gonna go with ProRes. I'm also outputting to 4K UHD, and the speed is gonna be 25 frames a second because I'm in the UK, and I'm gonna keep the speed at one point, uh, one actual speed that it was created at. You can actually speed it up. So if I click on that, you can speed it up to 16 times. So if you produce the video and it's not as fast a transition as you want, so mine, I think it's 50 seconds at the moment. If I wanted to double that to 25 seconds to fit into a certain video clip or something I'm producing, then I can obviously double that speed or quadruple it or whatever, just so that it fit, fits in and also speeds up. But I'm gonna keep it at one to one. I'm having the quality at ultra high and the, the gamut I'm having at four, sorry, the color sampling at 444, which is the highest quality you can get. Uh, again, I haven't done too much kind of processing with this, so I'm, I'd be intrigued to see how it comes out. Um, leave that as, as it is. And I would always force it out to 16 uh, to nine as a ratio and the, the um, UHD 4K. It just looks better. And if you want to compress it down to 1080p, you can do. Um, now, motion blur, this bit here, LRT motion blur, it's quite important because with the C at the beginning of my time lapse, I was doing quite fast exposures, maybe 250th of a second. So the C was frozen really highly. So it's going to look quite jittery. So what I'm going to do here is add about, let's call it medium high. I'm going to go to scale 10 uh, and I'm going to create some motion blur in the video. So everything that's relatively static will stay sharp. Anything that's moving quite a bit like the waves will actually show some motion blur. It may also do the same with the stars. It may cause a, a slightly um, nicer transition of the stars through the sky. So we'll see how that works. I'm not going to sharpen it because I can do that in post-production if I want to. Don't want any copyright overlay. That's pretty much it. It's going to output to um, the output file there. So that's going to be created. I'm going to leave everything as it is and then just click render video. And you should see down here, it'll start rendering the video and it's off. And it now says it's on frame three, frame five, frame seven. 
Uh, so it's going to take a little while. So again, I'm going to, it says it's going to take, let's just wait for that to settle down, 32 minutes, 31. Could be about 20 minutes for that to do. Actually, it's now around 11 and a half minutes. So we're going to pause everything and come back when that's done. And then we'll be able to check out the video in 4K to see how it looks. And obviously what I think I'll do before I show you it, because it produces quite a big file. So I'm going to take the exact same file and render it through Sony Vegas. So it will play smoothly on here just to show you. But it renders out quite a nice, good looking file. So I'll be intrigued to see how it looks. And we'll see you in a second once that's all been done. Okay, so that's done now. I've rendered it out in Sony Vegas. The file size was so big before and I've got so much open on my computer it wouldn't play properly. So this is the actual clip now. This is the, the time lapse. So you can see that it transitions nicely. It's a smooth movement. Uh, we're gonna start getting a bit darker in a minute. The You can see the water's actually pretty smooth. That smoothing effect works really well. I love the way that's working. See some people swimming about going into night time now really smooth transition that's looking really good lights are coming on the ships two people swimming in the sea with their lights underwater something goes across the sky there's the stars you can see you've got a bit of a trail behind the stars so that smoothing effect has possibly done a bit too much but overall that looks pretty good so again this is just a rushed thing obviously my children are off school at the moment my wife's working so I've got to kind of just wanted to show you how the transition works. So how to actually get from this kind of equipment using software to actually get that day to night transition. And that works really well. I mean, it's um, I'm really pleased with that for a very quick kind of edit where I haven't done too much with it. I haven't made the stars pop so much, possibly a bit too much blurring because the stars have got a bit of a trail behind them, but it looks really good. So I hope that helps. I hope you can see how by using some really cool equipment and some amazing software, how kind of easy it is to, to make this kind of transition work. And I'll show you some of the other stuff that I've done. Um, so this is just very quickly to show you some of the other time lapses I've done using the same kind of thing. This was a bridge, this was a daytime one using the slider going along the bridge. That was no day to, day to night. This was a day to night one, so you can see the lights coming on in the guest houses, stars appearing. This was up at Ab Abbotsbury with the, um, I used two cameras here. The first one was a panny. This is with the Canon. You can see the Milky Way going across. Um, flashing from traffic lights. This was the harbour in Weymouth. So again, you can see it all transitioning slowly. That was great. Sun plummets in out of the sky, all the lights come on and then the stars come up. So, you know, it's a really good kind of thing to get into. So the processes for doing this kind of time-lapse in a nutshell are A, shoot the time-lapse. Secondly, offload all your images to a computer. Next, you start up LR time-lapse, the software, and you find and click the folder with your images in. That will start the process of it loading into LR time-lapse. Then you follow the instructions along the top until you get to the point where it says drag into Lightroom. So you then drag all the photos into Lightroom. You edit all the keyframe images. So you filter out the keyframes, however many it's given you. So in this case, it was 19. Sometimes it's only four or five. So you edit all of those keyframe frame images. Then you go back to LR time-lapse and you follow the instructions there along the bottom. Then you export all the newly edited um, images, however many there are. And then after you've exported them all, the render thing will pop up, the, uh, the, the screen will pop up with the render stuff. Render it out to however you want, whether it's 4K or 1080 or whatever, or even 8K, and then that's your time lapse done. So it's actually a simple process, but it's quite hard because it takes so long. Some of the processes will maybe take up to an hour to offload all of the photos, then the rendering out of the time lapse. So it can take quite a while, but this is exactly my point why it's worth doing because if you're looking to sell and become an expert at this, and you're looking to sell some really amazing time lapses, then people are gonna to wanna to buy them rather than going through all of that process. They're not gonna to wanna to buy all the equipment, learn how to use it, learn how to take the photos, learn how to use the software, spend all that time rendering it out when they can go and buy one for a few hundred pounds off somebody else. It makes much more sense, especially if they've got a big budget. So that's pretty much it learn how to do time lapses and especially learn how to do the, the holy grail of time lapses, which is the transition from day to night or night to day, star trails, all of that kind of stuff, using some really cool equipment and the LRT uh, time lapse software and you'll be good to go. So I hope that helps. Um, thanks for watching this far um, and I hope to see some of your time lapses in the future.